So, we were talking about shareholders and um, how they get taxed and how they can pull money out of the company. So we were talking about they can get it as dividends, they can get it as a bonus, or they can pull it as a loan, but they have to repay it within a certain amount of time. So what other considerations for, ta for shareholders? Um, what happens with stock options? What happens with employees of a company who become shareholders? So let's assume we have um, Sam Co. Sorry, I've been told I have to stand behind the podium. So, um, so we have Samco. It's carrying on a business and it's got employees, 100 employees. And I say, you know what? These employees are doing such a great job. I want to incentivize them. I want to give them some equity in my company. So I'm going to issue them some stock. And let's say that my company, I have 100 employees, and my company is worth hundred dollars over what I have okay making the numbers work very easy here so if I say to them I'm going to e issue to each of my employees one share um, and if they pay and each share is worth a dollar because there's a hundred employees and the company is worth a hundred dollars each share is worth a dollar if the comp if I say to the employees give me the dollar you pay for it, you give me, pay me a dollar, the company a dollar, and we'll issue the share. That's fine. They paid for their share, but I don't want to do that. I don't want my company, my employees, to have to pony up the whole dollar. I want to give it to them for free, because it's perk of their being an employee. So I say I'm going to give you this share worth a dollar for nothing. I'm just going to gift it to you. CRA sees that that gifting of a stock a share worth a dollar, which has value, as extra employment income to the, share, to the employees, which means they have to pay, report that on their tax return, and they have to pay tax on that dollar worth of value. Even though they didn't get cash, they just got a share. So it seems kind of unfair, right? Like they don't, may not have the money to pay the tax on that dollar. So the CRA, the Income Tax Act, has some special rules that give some, you know, that, that make it easier for employees. Basically, they, if, cert, if the following conditions are in place, you'll get some benefit, and I'll tell you what the benefits are after. One, if an employee is arm's length with a company, arm's length means is not related in any way. It's not me, or it's who I'm, I'm the controlling shareholder. It's not one of my kids. It's not my, my, it's not my parents, not one of my siblings. It's somebody that's true arm's length, is not related to the company or to me in any way. And that em person, the employee, is really an employee of the company. And we entered into an agreement. I put in place a stock option agreement. You always hear the term stock options all the time, right? So I enter into an agreement and I say, as part of your compensation as an employee, I'm going to issue this stock for $0. The other condition is, if the company is a CCPC, so a Canadian controlled private company, it's controlled by me, I'm a Canadian resident, it's a private company, then you, the employee, don't have to pay tax on that $1 until you actually sell that share down the road, which is fair, right? Because when, you, when the employee eventually sells it, that's when he's going to get money, and then he can pay the tax. And what's the tax that he has to pay? The tax is going to be the difference between what he, the value of the share at the time we gave it to him, so we say it's worth a dollar, and the cost that the employee paid to acquire that share, which is zero. So the benefit that this employee got at the time that the stock was issued to him was one dollar. So that one dollar, which is subject to tax, won't come into play, it won't be subject to tax until down the road when he sells it. So then what's the tax rate when he sells? Remember, we say that this is another form of employment income, right? And employment income, the full amount of your employment income is subject to tax. But the CRA gives an even better uh, advantage to employees. They say, you know what? We're going to tax it as if it was a capital gain. So do you remember what the difference is between regular income and capital gains income? 
right, only half of it is subject to tax. So when he eventually sells that share, that benefit that he had, which was the dollar benefit at the time it was issued, it's only going to be pay taxed at 50%, so it's only a 50% tax, 50, sorry, tax on 50 cents that he has to pay. Now, of course, that's the original benefit. Of course, when he sells it, and those shares are now worth $10, so the first dollar, he only pays tax on 50 cents, but then the rest of it, that increase from a dollar to 10 bucks, because now it's gone up in value over the years that he's owned it, um, that is going to be a true capital gain. It's not employment income, it's a true capital gain. Again, that will also be 50% tax. Can I give us an example? Like, sh yeah, sure. Can everybody see when I draw here? Okay, because I don't want to have to bother him with moving the screen. Okay. So here's Samco, okay, and here's me. I control. So control. So I have employee one here. So at the time that this company, um, so let me use different, uh, do you want me to use the same dollar? So it's, okay, okay. So I have employee times 100, okay? I have 100 employees. Company, ignoring my interest in the company, the value of the shares we're going to give to the employees is $100. So I'm going to issue one share for each of the employees. So here's 100 employees, and each of them gets one share equal to $1. But they pay $0. That's their cost, right? So at the time, and this is, we're going to say this is day one. Day one is when we issue the stock to them today, right? So fair market value of the share is $1. What they paid for it, their cost, so we're going to cause a cost is $0. So because this is a CCPC, and because I've issued these shares to my employees as a result of their employment, and I put into place an agreement, they don't have to pay the tax. The tax would have been the difference between zero and a dollar, so a dollar would have been subject to, to tax as employment income, which would normally be taxed, the full dollar is subject to tax, right? So now we jump ahead to day 1,000. And let's say the fair market value of that share is $10. And they sell. They're like, this is a great place. So they're going to sell that share. So each employee sells their share, and they, make, they get $10. But remember, going back to day one, which is the taxable benefit, that $1 tax, this is a deferral. The CRA says, we're going to defer you having to pay tax on that $1 until you eventually sell, which is now going to be day 1,000. So that first $1 of value is your employment benefit. And CRA says, well, because we want to be nice to employees and it's a CCPC, we're going to tax it as if it was a capital gain. So you only have to pay capital gains tax on 50, 50 cents, right? Half of that difference. That is considered to be your employee or employment benefit. So you will report that under your, so the employee is going to report this part of it, this 50 cents, as part of their employment income, but as a result of stock options. But don't forget, they actually made $10 here. So the difference, so the first dollar we've dealt with, how it's, how it's taxed as an employee benefit. The next $9, that is just standard simple capital gains tax. So now we're going to say their cost for that purpose is going to be $1. The reason it's $1 is because we dealt with it up here, right? So now their cost is a dollar here, and they sold it at $10. $10. So their capital gain is 9 bucks. That's right. And they only have to pay tax on 50%. So $4.50. That's right. 
That is how this would work. So what, what is, what's the purpose here be behind this employee stock option rules? CRA says, yeah, you know what? This, this stock is a form of employment income, right? But it's not cash in your hands. It's just a share. So one, we're not going to tax you on it at the time you get the share, because that's not fair to you. You don't have money to pay the tax. So we'll tax it when you eventually sell it. And two, we're not going to tax it as regular income, so that the full dollar is subject to tax. Because again, it wasn't cash in your hands from the very beginning. We're going we're to give you a break here and only tax 50% of it. Wouldn't the cost be 50 cents because 50 cents is the tax and 50 cents is the income? I'm glad you asked that because I want to clarify why the difference between 50 cents and $1. The tax is only 50%, but the capital gain is a dollar. So when you determine your cost for down here, you have to work off the capital gain as your, the capital gain becomes your cost. And the capital gain is technically one dollar, but you only pay tax on 50 cents. 50, 50 cents goes to the income. Yeah. So if the question was, what's your total income on $10, it would be five dollars. Your total income from here? Yeah. yeah, that's right. For tax purposes, Thank correct. You. 450 here, 50 cents here. Sorry, sorry, I couldn't hear you. So, so, sorry, so, so when, when you receive the shares, yeah. um, you declare the 50 cents per share as income for that year? No, no. 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 You don't have to make any, you don't have to okay. declare in the year at all. Okay. You just hold on to it. Okay. You only have to declare this on day 1,000 when you eventually sell. Okay, so it's the new year back, right? Yeah. Sell them. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Yeah, so, so you break it down into two portions, two calculations, right? You, for t purposes of the act, you have to. Uh, you say fair market value at the time that we issue it was a dollar. So you got a, a dollar benefit as an employee, right? So you have to remember that is always going to be part of your calculation when you eventually sell. At the t this becomes your ACP at the time of the sale, sale for, um, well, you have, you're going to do two calculations at the time of the sale. The first calculation is going to be, your first calculation is at the time that the share was issued. So what was the fair market value at the time that the share was issued was a dollar, and your cost base was, a do was zero, right, because you didn't pay anything. So that's going to be your first step. So you create, you calculate your tax there, it's 50 cents. Then you go to the next step, and you say, okay, well, I actually, the share is now worth $10, what do, how do I calculate the rest of the tax? This is just a true capital gain. It has nothing to do with your employment income. You're going to use your cost base of a dollar. That's just the number of application. Yeah, correct, correct. You would not use a zero here because that would be unfair. Then you're paying tax again on that extra dollar, right? So yeah. This is a regular capital gain calculation. This is going to be, it's a whole different set of sections of the Income Tax Act to calculate it which gets you the same result, but it's different sections of the act that deal with employee stock options. So, so the sections you should know, I don't know if it's going to be your sections, but it, um, section seven of the Income Tax Act. Um, and and um, if you go through them, it'll take you through how that works. Clear as mud, right? OK. All right. Um, right, so I think I talked about all that stuff. OK. So I was just going to say, now we're going to get technical. And I know you're going to be like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Weren't we? Um, but we're going to talk about shares. So we've talked about corporations and how that's taxed. We've talked about shareholders and employees and how they get taxed when it comes to companies. But now we're going to talk about the shares themselves, right? So we're talking about this. So let me. Um, So here I am. I incorporate Samco. Okay. 
Okay, so the, how many people took business law in law school? I mean, yeah, okay. So do you remember people, when you talked about the basics of shares, do you remember hearing about stated capital? Do you remember what it meant? I didn't at the time, okay. Stated capital for corporate law purposes is basically um, the money you put into a corporation for the issuance of shares. So I form Samco. I need to subscribe for shares. So I say I'm going to subscribe for 100 common shares and I'm going to pay $100 for it, right? So, and, and just so you know, this is, this is going to get confusing when you think about, because we talked about adjusted cost base for partnerships. Cost base applies for anything. It's what you pay for to acquire property. So my shares, I paid $100 for my 100 common shares. So that's my cost base. I have paid $100 to get that asset, right? But when we look at corporate law, this $100 is considered also to be stated capital. So stated capital is basically the capital in these shares, which is the money that went into the company. So now the company has $100, right? Because I took $100, I bought these shares, I put it in. So the company has $100. These shares, we have this, account, th this concept of stated capital so that the class of common shares, we issued common shares, we create a ledger on the side for corporate law purposes. This is weird. So we're going to create a ledger here that's called stated capital. So I've issued 100 common shares, and we have $100. So we get plus $100. That's the stated capital for the common shares of Samco. If uh, my husband comes in, his name's Tess. If Tess comes in and he buys common shares and he also takes 100 common shares for $100, so that now the company is now worth 200, that's $100 also going to the stated capital for the common shares. So stated capital is for the common shares, so now we get plus another 100. So we're at $200 for stated capital. Um, now, there are 200 shares outstanding, right? 200 common shares. $200 of stated capital. So each share has stated capital of a dollar. If my husband had come in for 100 common shares, but he only paid, he, he actually paid more. I made him pay more money. He paid $200 for that. Okay, so the company's worth 300 there would have been an addition, oops, sorry, addition of 200. So stated capital is worth $300. So we have stated capital of $300, but only 200 shares issued. This $300 gets averaged out over 200 shares. So now each share is worth $1.50. Let me do my math right. Each share has stated capital of $1.50. So I, I benefit a little here, right? Because I made him pay more. That's corporate law, stated capital. What does this mean for tax law? So tax, we like to, as you know, make things complicated. It's the same concept, except it is a concept that's from my perspective, personal, not as a class. And we use the, t we use the words paid up capital. People will sometimes say, well, stated capital for corporate law purposes and paid up capital for tax purposes are exactly the same. Not quite, not quite. Stated capital, as I said, that is a corporate law concept and it is for the class of shares, for all the common shares. Paid up capital is only from my perspective. What is it that I have in my shares? It's not as a class, it's just as uh, for what I paid. And what did my husband pay for his shares? So even though we have $300, my paid up capital in my 100 shares is $100. My husband's paid up capital for his shares is 200. This is relevant for our personal tax, okay? This means that Tess, he can pull out $200 
from the company tax-free because that's the capital he put in. I can only pull out $100 tax-free. I can't pull out $150. I can't say, oh, well, it's averaged out. and That's a corporate law concept. For tax purposes, I can't. I can only pull out $100 because that's my personal paid-up capital, right? So how do you pull out money from, how do you pull out paid-up capital? So now I'm going to change the, I'm going to get rid of this because we don't want to talk about state of capital today. I'm going to talk about paid-up capital. So PUC, we call it. Uh oh puck. So Sam's puck is 100, Tess's puck is, a, is 200. So how do I pull money out? Well, there's a different ways you can do it. So you can reduce puck. Um, basically, the corporation can say, we're going to um, take your shares, and, and we actually say we're going to reduce the paid up capital. It's, uh, yeah? Because that's what he put into the company. That's his investment. Whenever you put an investment in, the amount of money that you put into a company, that's your investment. That's your money. It's your personal money. You can always take that back out tax free. It's anything over the $200 that he would have to pay tax on. So if we say we just want to pull, like my husband says, you know what, this company really isn't going anywhere. It's, Sam's a horrible business person, and I'm going to pull, I want to take my money out. But there, ha and there still is, there's money here. There's 300, right? I just don't like her business plan. So I'm going to, I want my money back. How do you do that? Um, it's not just the company writing a check. We have to do it by way of a puck reduction. So you can do it in, um, we can say, in different ways. You can either say um, there'll be a corporate resolution that says we're going to reduce the puck. So you artificially, it's a tax concept, artificially um, reduce the capital of the shares. You can do this under the, under the OBCA. And you return the money back. So I'm going to reduce my puck by $200 and pull up the shares. Pull, I pull up $200 and it goes to him. The shares still stay in place. We're not canceling the shares. That's the difference, right? Reduction of puck means you're just going to reduce the paid up capital of those shares, return the money tax free, but he still keeps his 50% shares. Another way to do it is if he says, I don't even want shares in this company. I just want to get out clean. We can purchase these shares for cancellation. So the company says, OK, I'm going to buy back these shares and cancel them and give you $200. Whenever you have that sort of thing where a company redeems or, or cancels out shares owned by a shareholder, it's considered to be a deemed dividend. Remember, dividend's the way you get money out of the company. Your deemed dividend is calculated by the amount of money that Tess receives over his paid up capital. So here, a company buys back his shares for $200. So his what he receives is $200. His paid up capital in his shares is $200. So 200 less 200, no tax, right? If he made a fuss and said, you know what? I spent a lot of time. You need to buy back my shares, and I want $300 for the shares. And the company says, fine, fine. So we, the company buys back the shares and gives him $300. 200 of that, the first 200 comes out tax free to him because that's a return of capital. That extra $100 is considered a deemed dividend and that will be subject to dividend tax. So you have to pay tax on some of it. So um, remember we talked about eligible dividend versus ineligible dividend? So in this scenario, um, you would still, that still applies. You'd have to look to see what type of income this company had. If it actually had no income and didn't pay any tax, it would likely be an ineligible dividend. Um, and so the rates are, and I don't know off the top of my head, but they are in the 40s. Uh, in, ineligible is probably, sorry, I take it, yeah, ineligible is probably, I wish I, sh I should know this. It should be around mid 40s somewhere. I might be in your materials. I, I don't have access to your current materials, so I don't know what they would have put there. Okay. Questions? Yes. Um, I'm, I'm with 
concept. Yeah. Personal? Is different than State of capital. Um, oh, so, um, so cost base and puck. So it, usually your puck and your ACB of your shares, they would traditionally, sometimes, generally sometimes be the same, right? But not always. So my, my puck, right, I put in $100. My puck is 100 but it's also my cost base. So my ACB is 100 right? There are times where they can differ. For example, uh, what, what, what could be an example? Um, if the, if, um, oh, here's a good example. If I die, okay? When I die, and let's assume my puck is, let me put my um, numbers up because it's easy when you see numbers. So my puck is 100 and my ACB is 100, right? Okay? And I don't do anything, it's all the same. I die. Death. When I die, I'm deemed to have sold all of my assets right before death, and I have to, my estate has to, I have capital gains tax on death, right? So what happens is, let's say on death, the value of the company is now worth $500 gone up in value. So when I die, I'm deemed to have sold these assets at 500 and, and my death tax is going to be the difference between 500 and 100, my ACB, right? So there's a tax that my state pays of $400. It's fine. So now these shares, now my estate owns these. I use a triangle for trusts and estates, okay? So now my estate owns these shares. But now, Puck, nothing happens with Puck. Puck's still $100. But my ACB, my estate's ACB in these shares now is $500. Because there was that deemed sale, deemed disposition on death, so my estate had to pay the tax. So it bumps up my cost base of these shares to the fair market value at the time of my death. So now, post death, you do have a different number. So if um, after my, my death, my estate says, I want to sell my interest. And if it says to Samco, buy back my shares. Remember, that's considered a dividend. So you look at the value that you got back, 500 over the puck. So you say, well, wait, whoa, wait. This is kind of a weird mismatch. My estate's already paid $500. I mean, tax on $400. Um, and now I'm going to have the company buy back these shares, but now I have to pay dividend tax on $400? That doesn't make sense, right? It's double tax again. So there are rules, and I think actually I have it in my next slide. Uh, yeah. Um, there are rules that say, well, wait a minute. Um, the, the amount of the, um, which I think how to say that, the amount of the, so, so let me back up. So first, this is where you could have different numbers. But what happens here on death? How do we, how do we deal with this? The CRA says, listen, if it buys back the shares, the shares have an ACB of 500, but only puck of 100, we're going to reduce the amount that you're deemed to receive, so you get $500, we're going to reduce that down by, by 400 because your estate paid that tax. So at the end of the day, there's no tax on a redemption. But, so I, I was getting to another example, but my key thing, going back to your particular question, when would you have these numbers different? Like, they not, are not always going to be the same. Things cannot happen. You could have Another example, let me give you an easier example. I think I might have complicated everybody with this one because I got into death taxes and stuff. Oh, sorry, Sam. So Puck, 100, ACB of 100, okay? Let's assume I sell my shares to my husband. So Tess buys them, and I say it's worth 500 now. You give, give me $500. So now these shares are gone. They go to him. He has ACB 
of 500 because that's what he paid to buy those shares, right? But Puck doesn't change. It's still going to be $100 because the Puck is still the, the paid up capital. What happens in terms of cost base doesn't necessarily affect your Puck. So you do have a bit of a mismatch there. Um, if he sells it to somebody else for 500, he doesn't have a capital gain, right? Because he's got full cost base. But if the company bought them back, you would have he would have a deemed dividend. So, um, so the whole idea with Puck and ACB is that they can start off the same, but then they can differ. So when you're doing strategies like uh, buying, selling shares redeeming shares by a company, you have to think about what's the best way here. I don't want to, like if I, if I have um, real ACB, maybe there's something I can do with that instead of doing a deemed dividend and creating tax. When will the puck change? The puck will change if I continue to put money into the company. Yeah. The puck does not change. So it's always yeah, but if, but if afterwards my husband says, you know what, I need this company needs more money. I need to inject it with more, more capital. So he goes, I'm going to add an extra two hundred dollars, and I'm going to put it as an injection of capital on these shares. That puck will be increased by two hundred, right? Because it's think of puck. Your paid up capital is the money that you you capitalize the company with so with your shares. 300, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, another way, actually going to your question, um, another way that it, puck can change, and I have it here on this bullet, um, you can increase puck and decrease puck by corporate law steps. Um, if you increase puck, if the company says, I'm going to increase this puck, so let's go back to my regular one. For some reason, I want to get some, I, I'm going to increase the puck. Why would you do that? Maybe some corporate law reasons, um, or you just want to build up some more capital in your shares. So the company can actually increase the puck. But if you increase the puck, that's going to trigger a deemed dividend because you've basically um, created more ways of taking money out tax-free so that's going to trigger some, a dividend. Now you can also decrease, well, we talked about that, you can decrease puck as a way of getting money out. Um, when we do that, for corporate law purposes, your documents are not going to refer to paid up capital. They're not going to say increase puck or decrease puck. They're going to say increase stated capital, decrease stated capital because that's just the language they use for corporate law purposes. Okay. Oh, question. How is the deemed dividend taxed? Um, so it's at a deemed dividend is taxed at dividend rates, just like if a company paid a dividend. Um, we say it's a deemed dividend because even though the company didn't formally take the steps to declare a dividend, um, you took money out of the company, so we're going to treat it as if it was a dividend. So it'll be taxed um, at the regular dividend rate. So if it's eligible dividend, it's taxed at, I think that's the low 40s. Ineligible dividend is mid 40s. Don't, don't quote me on that. I, I don't have that number on top of my front of me. Okay, so we've talked about the basics. We've talked about corporations, how they're taxed. We've talked about shares, the concept. We've talked about shareholders, how they get money. So now we're going to talk about things you can do with your company, strategies, stuff. So um, Section 85 rollover. So what happens here? Um, I have... Here I am, and I have a piece of land, right? I own it personally. And um, I don't want to own it personally anymore. Why? Oh, maybe because there's environmental problems. I don't want anybody suing me. I don't want somebody step it, falling on my piece of land and suing me. I'd rather have it in a company. 
so that it's protect I have protection, creditor proofing, right? So I form FAMCO. And I want to take this land and put it into the company. If I just transferred the land to the company, CRA is going to say, well, wait a minute, okay, you own the company, so you're related to the company, and you're going to transfer an asset for nothing? No, you can't just do that. If I transfer the company, I'm considered to have sold the property to the company at the, at the property's fair market value. So let's assume my, my um, cost, my ACB is 100 and fair market value is 500. So if I just transferred it into the company for nothing, um, I'm going to be taxed as if I sold it to the company for $500, even though I didn't get any money. And I'm going to have to pay capital gains tax on 400000 so 50% instead of the tax. So the Section 85 rollover is a mechanism that allows you to transfer capital property to a company without triggering tax. So CRA lets you do that. So what it does is it says, when you transfer the land here, as long as you take back shares, even if I have shares, if you take back more shares in the company, then we're going to treat it as if you transferred the land at the ACB of 100, not 500. So there's no tax. So I have a cost base of 100. I'm deemed to have or elected to have transferred the property in at, at 100. So there's no tax. So this is what Section 85 does. It, it, it provides the rules under which you can do this. So as we say, you can, it's a means to transfer capital property to a company on a tax deferred basis. So the conditions are that the company, Samco, has to be a Canadian corporation. We didn't talk about Canadian corporations. We talked about Canadian controlled private corporations. Canadian corporation just means that it's incorporated in Canada and resident in Canada for tax purposes. Okay. So, on top of that, when I transfer the land in, I have to take back some sort of consideration, right? I'm going to have to take back consideration that includes shares of the company. So, I, I have to ensure that when I transfer the land, I take back more shares of the company. Um, there can be other things I can take back. So I could probably say, if the company happens to have cash, um, I can take back some cash as well. But I have to take back shares. There has to be an element of shares that's given back to me, or else this, it, the rollover doesn't work. If the company happened to have $500 of cash, and if it says, and th if they say, if I say, okay, I'm going to transfer the land to the company, I'm going to elect under Section 85, and elect to transfer it $100, and the company says, okay, well, I'll give you I'll give you money, I'll just give you $100 without any shares. That doesn't work. The, the interesting thing here, and this is where, so bear with me here, stick with me here. The company has to give back shares, but the shares are going to have a value of $500. So I'm actually going to get $500 of value back in the form of shares, but I am electing under Section 85 to treat it as if I only transferred it in at $100. So it's not like I'm only going to get $100 worth of shares back, because that's not fair. I should still get the real value of the land. But we're treating the transfer price as $100, even though I, only got, even though I got $500 worth of value back. And that $500 of value has to include shares. You can include some cash. If the company happens to have some cash, I can get some cash. What's the limit of cash I can take back? The limit is my ACB. I can only take back up to $100 worth of cash. The rest of the $400 of value can be in, is in, in the form of shares. Call that non-share consideration. Um, 
another way, if it's not cash, up to $100, I could get back a promise, promissory note the company promises to pay me. Basically, I can take back something from the company up to $100 that allows me to take up to $100 out of the company tax-free. And that's because I have cost base of $100. That's my money I put into it, into the land. I should always be able to take that $100 back out tax-free, even if it's in a company. Does that make sense? Um, so what type of property can I transfer in under Section 85? It's called eligible, cap, eligible property. Basically, it has to be a capital asset, meaning um, it's asset that I don't own as part of a business, for, or sorry, that's not inventory. Inventory is a bad no-no, right? If you have inventory, you can't transfer that in under Section 85. Um, real property, like land, that is inventory. So I'm transferring land. But if I have land as inventory, let's say I'm a real, a real estate developer and I have like 100 parcels of land, that's really considered a business. So each parcel is my inventory. I can't transfer one of those pieces in. Um, it won't work. But for me, I happen to just buy this land on my own. I've held it for a number of years. I'm not in the business of selling land, so it's okay for me to transfer it in. Your elected amount, that's how we do this without triggering tax. Remember, you have to file an election with the CRA when you transfer under Section 85. And the election is going to say, I, Sam, am transferring this property worth $500,000 to the company. And I am going to elect to transfer it at my cost base, which is $100. And that's considered to be my sale price for purposes of tax, so I don't have any tax. And that is also considered to be Sanco's cost of the property. So now, the land is here, and we have a uh, fair market value of $500, but the company's cost base is still 100 because it inherits my original cost base. And under the election, we agreed that we were going to transfer it for tax purposes at $100. So Samco, even though it issued value, like shares and cash with $500, it still only has a $100 cost base. So when this com if this company turned around the next day, so we transferred in on day one, and then on day two, Samco says, oh, okay, I'm going to now sell it to Mr. Smith down the street, and I'm going to sell it at $500, it will have the capital gain. The capital gain will be at the company level. So I basically moved it from me to the company. Okay? So you're not ab avoiding tax. You're, you're just deferring it until you know, such a later time. So, it, so the whole purpose behind Section 85 is to allow individuals to do some tax planning with their companies, to put assets into a company. Another great example is, uh, remember we were talking about types of businesses. So if I am a sole proprietor, so I'm carrying on my business of making necklaces in the basement. Um, and I decide, you know what? I don't like this liability because I'm a sole proprietor. I want to have that creditor proofing and have a corporation, so I move, put my business into the company. You can avail yourself of Section 85. So you transfer your business as a whole, which is considered eligible property. I can transfer my entire business to the company, and take back shares. It's a way I, of incorporating myself, and I don't trigger tax. Yes? So the value of the shares are going to be the fair market value. Okay. Yeah. You, you can't just make that money now. No, it's going to be your fair market value. So let's so let's so we have the land here. This is land, right? Now what I have done is ex I'm ex I've exchanged my asset from land to now shares of Samco. So my shares have an ACV of a hundred, but a fair market value of 500. So if I turn around and sold my shares, then I would have a gain here. So, uh, yes, we would add, yes, that's right. 
your ACB and your PUC for these shares would also be 100 because 100 is what you've contributed to the company. Yeah. I shouldn't have worn black pants with white chalk here. OK. Um, so my last bullet here, I talk about limits, upper limits and lower limits for your elected amount. So remember, the idea is that when you transfer property under Section 85, you're going to elect to transfer. You want to elect to transfer at your cost base. That doesn't trigger any tax. But you don't have to. Um, you can, if you decide um, for whatever reason, I'm going to transfer it in at $300 because I would like to get a bit more cost here and I'm happy to pay a bit of tax, you can elect at $300. The limits in terms of what that elected amount are this. At the lower end, you can you can only elect your cost. You can elect under $100 in this example. The lowest amount you can elect is $100, which is your elected amount. The highest you can elect is the fair market value, 500. So you have to be within that. You have to be $100 on the low end or up to 500 on the high end. And anything you elect above 100 is going to be subject to capital gains in your hands. So here we have an example, OK? I know I just did one, um, but this is going to be a little bit more. I'm going to take it to a, a little bit more complicated um, example. So we have um, so we have Mr. Jackson. Okay, he has land, and he has building. His land has an ACB of thirty thousand. Right? We have thirty k, and its fair market value is seventy five thousand. So ACB, I can't remember what I wrote, fair market value. Building, now when you have land and building, they are considered technically separate assets, right? Because why? Land is capital property, so is building, but building is a, can be depreciated. So do you know what that means when we say we depreciate something? It's, um, if it's an asset such as a building, you can write down, uh, depreciate it, so you can write down its value over time. And you get it as a current expense. Uh, we call it capital cost allowance. Um, but, um, but you can do that with business assets. So, um, and, and typically, you can do it with buildings. So, if I so the building here has a cost of 85000 OK? It has, I say UCC, I'm going to tell you, 40,000. What does that mean, UCC? UCC means undepreciated capital cost. That means that I had a cost base at the building of 85,000, and I depreciated it. I claimed expenses for it and wrote, wrote it down, down to 40,000. So I basically claimed depreciation expenses of $45,000 over, over, over the time I've owned the building to date, OK? Which means that my undepreciated capital cost, which is the cost amount of the, land, of the building that I have not depreciated, is 40000 That's relevant, because when you're dealing with depreciable assets, you're going to have cost base, and you're going to have your undepreciated cost base. That is going to be relevant in how we determine tax, OK? I'm going to come to that. And we have fair market value of 100 k So. We have company, OK? So I've got the, the numbers here. So we incorporate in a company, Opco. And Mr. Jackson says, I'm going to transfer my land and building in. And um, before I ask you the question, I'm going to spend a little bit of time about the UCC. So we know the land has cost base of 30, fair market value of 75. So remember, you think about what your capital gain would be there. If you're building and determining your capital gain, you're going to say, well, what's my capital gain? You're going to say, well, my cost base is 85000 and fair market value is 100000 right? But I also have this $40,000 of UCC, meaning I've already written down $45,000 of expenses. When you sell an asset that you've written down, below your cost base, that's going to be subject to tax, but not as a capital gain. It's, we call it recapture. You're basically CRA saying, we're recapturing 
these expenses you, you deducted. And it's going to be full tax. So, um, so what happens is this. So I've asked here, what are the tax consequences if we just transferred the land and building to the company without doing a Section 85? Now, I think this is a bit of an unfair question to you guys because we didn't spend a lot of time on the and depre like depreciated assets. But if somebody wants to take a guess, you want to take a guess, go for it. Uh, it's still counting down $45,000. Okay. So do you, can you explain it? Um, so for the, the land, the capital gain is proceeds of disposition minus the adjusted cost base. Yep. So 75K minus 30K equals $5,000. Correct. For the building, um, it's the fair market value of the building minus the undepreciated capital cost. Okay, so you're close. You got the right idea, but it's a little bit more complicated. Let me tell you why. It's actually the last bullet. The reason is this, because you're right about the land. You have the $45,000 capital gain on the land, 75 less 30,000. Building, yeah, you start with 100,000 as your fair market value, that's right you have to first look to your cost base for capital gain purposes. Your cost base here is 85,000. So the difference between 185 is 15,000. That's your capital gain. Then you, so th you're looking at this number and this number. Then with respect to depreciation, you're gonna look at this number and this number. So you're going to start and say, okay, so we have $15,000 capital gain between $100,000 and eighty-five. But on top of that, we depreciated the, the building more. So I'm going to start with $85,000 as my cost base, and I depreciate it down to $40,000. So I have a difference between these two of $45,000 of recapture. So when you look at it, it's $45,000 capital gain on the land. $15,000 capital gain on the land, on the building, so that gives you the $60,000 capital gain, and then you have $45,000 to recapture. Did you follow, does everyone follow that? What's the recapture used for? So recapture, what is it? So, re, so when you have a building, and so we're going to say the cost base of the building was $85,000, right? And I'm going to go back to my slide here so you can see it. Okay, so the building has cost base of $85,000. And while I owned it, I depreciated it, meaning like I was, let's say I was renting it out for business purposes. And um, when you do that, when you're taking an asset, when you're an asset and you're using it for business purposes, so I'm using it to earn rental income, um, I can depreciate the building. So it's a building that is, wears down over time, right? Um, you can, um, and, and there's a whole schedule in the regulations. I'm not going to go there. You don't need to worry about this. I think for, you don't need to worry about this for your exam. Um, but it says, CRA says you can write down the cost of your building over time and take it in as a as an expense. As an expense. So you spent eighty-five thousand dollars, and we'll let you write off. And uh, let's assume it. Uh, I can't remember what it is for buildings. Let's assume it's ten percent. You can write off ten percent of the cost every year. Um, so in year one, 10% of 80000 is 8500 dollars You can claim that as an expense, and that gets to be offset against your income you earn from the building, right? So that's a pretty good deal. Like you're getting an expense, and it's it's a way to offset your income. But when you eventually sell, as you're as when as you're writing it down, you have to keep track of what you're writing it down. So in the first year, you've gone from 85000 less 8500 So now you're you're UCC is 85,000 less 8,500 after first year. So we keep going it down to 40,000. So when you eventually sell the property, CRA says, yeah, you got the benefit of these expenses while you owned it, right? You can use it to offset income, so you paid less income. You have to pay that back now. That's what recapture is. You have to pay back the expense that you got to claim before. So you're going, well, what's the point, right? What's the point of even getting this expense? Well, the point is that you got to claim it as a current, like you got to claim it while you owned it. So that's less money you paid in the past. 
you only have to pay this tax when you eventually sell. So that's what we call a deferral. You've got a current tax savings. You only have to pay the tax whoops, when you eventually sell. That's not going to be for a long time. So there's a bit of savings there. So that's what recapture is. Recapture is just your way, CRA's way of saying, we're going to tax you on the expenses, you, the deductions you got before. So it's added to your income? Yeah. Right. So you don't pay the capital gain over you pay the income? Correct. That's right. So, on the, so at the end of the day, um, which is the bottom bullet, you got capital gain of 60000 You only have to pay tax on 50% of that. Recapture of forty five. you have to pay tax on the full forty five. So this is an example of if you didn't do anything. So if we decide we want to take advantage of the Section 85 election. So let's use this example. Mr. Jackson owns a land and building. And just for clarity, he doesn't own any other land or any other building. This is just one asset. What assets would he be able to roll into the company on a Section 85 basis? I'm going to make somebody answer. Okay. Yep. You can get both of them. And you're going to say, well, wait a minute, Sam. You talked about real property, inventory. You can't transfer that. That's if Mr. Jackson owned 100 buildings, so he was really in the business of carrying on a rental property. That one building would theoretically be considered to be inventory, so he wouldn't be able to tra transfer the building. But because he only owns the one building and the one land, it's just one asset of his, it's going to be capital property, and it will be uh, you can, it will be eligible for this transfer on a, uh, on a tax deferred basis. Okay, so one more question. So now we decide, Mr. Jackson says, okay, I'm going to transfer the land and building to the company, and I'm going to do it and, uh, and under Section 85. So in order for me to transfer it without triggering any tax, what would be the elected amount that you would use? You look at the land and building. So let me go back to the previous slide. So you have the numbers handy. Give me a second. Oh, this is very difficult to navigate. Uh, OK. Nope. Sorry. Sorry, guys. Right. So if we wanted to transfer the land and building into the company under Section 85, what is the elected amount, the total elected amount, he's going to do for both land and building to make sure he doesn't trigger tax? Sorry? Yeah, for the building and, so, sorry, this is for the building. I apologize, for the building. What's going to be the tra what's the amount that we transfer in without triggering any tax to him? The cost base. What's the cost base that? Forty thousand. So. Is that the, the yes, correct. It's going to be your undepreciated capital cost. So, if you transferred in at his adjusted cost base and not his UCC, his adjusted cost base, right, was eighty-five thousand. If we transfer in at eighty-five thousand, you're going to trigger a recapture, right? This, the Section eighty-five election will allow you to transfer it at the UCC, the lower amount. But what is the consequence of that? It means that the company gets the cost base of the, land, of the building at the lower amount, 40000 so it only gets $40,000 to depreciate. If we had transferred it in at eighty five, dollars which is his cost amount, you would have triggered recapture to him. But then the company would at least would get an $85,000 cost base, and that's more money it can depreciate. So CRA says you can't get a benefit here without triggering tax here. So what we want to do is we want to transfer it at its UCC value, undepreciated cost amount of 40000 It will not trigger any recapture. It will not trigger any capital gains. So I mentioned that there is a filing requirement. So you can't just do this and not tell anybody. Um, you have to file an election with the CRA. And then it's a joint election. So it has to be filed by both Mr. Jackson and OPCO. They both have to sign the form. Um, the form is T2057. Um, and in the form, they're going to ask for all sorts of information. I'm going to say, well, what's the property transferred? Um, what's the fair market value? What's the elected, sorry, what's the cost base? And what's the UCC? And what amount are you electing at? It's 
So it's all basically columns, and you just plug in your numbers. Um, and they're also going to ask, what is the paid up capital of the shares in, that you're issuing in OPCO? And you're going to say, huh? Well, wait a minute. We just transferred land and building. We're not talking about paid up capital. But we are. You answer, you, when it, I think you asked the question. We're transferring in and giving back shares. So we have to make an addition to this paid up, cap, paid up capital. And the addition is going to be that elected amount, right? So you're going to make an addition to your, um, your, your paid up capital, um, which is, for corporate law purposes, going to be the same for now for stated capital. Okay, That's when it's going to be the same. So then um, I was going to take off this last bullet, but I'll, but I'll mention it. So what kind of shares can you issue? So if it's just me, I'm going to just issue regular common shares. Common shares are your regular vanilla type of com uh, uh, shares. Basically, if the company goes down in value, the common shares go back down in value. So they kind of fluctuate with the value of the company. Preferred shares don't fluctuate. They are set and frozen at a particular value. So when we transferred in those assets, we had um, fair market value of the land and building was 175000 if we had issued preferred shares, those preferred shares would always be worth 175000 So if the company's value, if the, co if the land and building went up from one hundred seventy-five dollars to $200,000 in value, Mr. Jackson's preferred shares don't go up in value. He's frozen at the one hundred seventy-five dollars because that's what preferred shares are. Preferred shares are almost like debt. The bonus thing about a preferred share is that he gets to cash in whenever he wants. You can't really do that with common shares. So why on earth would somebody take back preferred shares if it, will not, if, if it means that they're frozen at that value? Um, we do this all the time with families. Um, if we have Mr. Jackson who owns Opco and he wants to give his kids an equity interest in the company, so let's say he transferred it all in to the company for common shares, um, and then he says, I want to gift 25% to each of my kids. That's going to be a transfer that will trigger tax in his hands. Because if you gift um, assets to your family members and your cost base is only, what was his cost base is going to be only 70000 and the fair market value is 175 you you're going to trigger tax to him and you're going to trigger tax to the kids. So one way to get the kids into the company um, is it's called an estate freeze. He transfers in the building and land, and he takes back preferred shares that are frozen at the 175000 And then we issue new growth shares to his kids, which give them 25%. And that way, those shares are issued for no value, because all the value in the company is like sucked up into his preferred shares. So, so um, it, it, just keep that in mind. I don't know if it will be on your exam. I didn't see any materials, but if they do, if they say, if there's a question like, what would be the difference of issuing common shares versus preferred shares, the key thing to think about is that common shares will continue to fluctuate and grow as the company grows or decreases as the company decreases. Preferred shares are frozen in time at the fair market value and will not fluctuate as the company changes value. Um, so I've highlighted a couple of other sections. These are other tax-deferred sections you can use to deal with property. Section 85 is where you transfer, you actually transfer assets into a company. Section 86, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, it's just, it's in your materials, I think. It's like a little blurb, I think, like this, based on last year's materials. Section 86 is where, um, basically, I have... 100 shares, common shares, and their ACB is $100. Fair market value is $1,000. And I want to take those common shares and exchange them for preferred shares, like we just talked about. If I just did that, if I exchange them, I will trigger tax. But if, I, if my paperwork makes reference to Section 86, it allows you to ex do it an exchange of shares on a tax deferred basis. So it's as if I exchange these common shares for preferred shares at $100. Okay? Um, section 51 is the same thing. Um, and uh, 85.1 is, uh, 
it's not used very often. It's basically um, where you're going to uh, exchange shares with another comp in another company. But you don't, I, I've, in my 18 years of practice, I've never done Section 85.1. But they all have their own separate uh, requirements. Um, one of the differences between these ones and Section 85, you do not have to file an election with the CRA for these ones. 